Hi guys, this is Mr. Mani. For today's lesson, we're going to review some basics about chemical reactions and about acids. However, we will mostly focus on a couple of chemistry topics you may be unfamiliar with, but they're actually pretty important in biochemistry. The first is Le Chatelier's principle of dynamic equilibrium in chemical reactions, and the second is chemical buffers. So let's begin by reviewing the parts of a chemical equation. We start with the reactants, which undergo the chemical reaction to form the products. In the process, bonds in the reactants are broken and new bonds are formed, but at no point are any atoms created or destroyed during the chemical reaction. You may remember this as the law of conservation of mass, and the reason why you had to learn how to balance chemical equations and get grade 10 chemistry. Most chemical reactions are depicted by a single arrow pointing from the reactants to the products. As we explore the chemical reactions that occur in the body, we will find that many of them are reversible. That means that the forward reaction is possible, but so is the reverse reaction. So we use double arrows to represent these types of reactions. And these reactions will try to achieve something called dynamic equilibrium. This means that both the forward and reverse reactions are occurring at the same rate. So even if the reaction is happening, the concentration of reactant and the concentration of product remain constant. Constant, not equal. There may be more of one compound or more of the other, but the relative concentrations will remain the same, since both are being produced at the same rate. By the way, often in science we use symbols as uh, shortcuts when writing out descriptions. The square brackets you see surrounding the words products and reactants actually mean concentration of. So from now on, if you see anything written inside square brackets, you should read it as the concentration of whatever is inside the brackets. So for the definition of giving you here for dynamic equilibrium, it would read as forward and reverse reactions at the same rate, concentration of products and concentration of reactants stop changing. So back to chemical reactions. Obviously, reactions cannot always remain under dynamic equilibrium, especially in living things. Living cells are constantly under stressors or events that throw off that equilibrium. Let's look at the analogy of these ants moving rocks to the right and to the left at the same rate to represent both a forward and reverse reaction. Even though the ants are constantly moving the rocks, the sizes of the piles remain the same. That's dynamic equilibrium. A stressor might be something adding or removing rocks from the piles. This changes the concentration of the rocks in that pile and throws off the dynamic equilibrium the, the ants had been working hard to keep. So Le Chatelier's principle, also known as the equilibrium law, states that when a system experiences a disturbance or stress, it will respond to restore a new equilibrium state. So the system is usually a reversible reaction. And the disturbance can be either a change in temperature, or a change in pressure, or a change in the concentration of either the reactants or the products. Now in living systems, where significant changes in temperature or pressure would pretty much lead to cell death, Le Chatelier's principle only applies to changes in concentration, really. So let's take a look at this general reversible reaction right here. A plus 2B produce C plus D. Now this reaction is under dynamic equilibrium so that the concentrations of A and B and of C and D remain constant. Le Chatelier's principle aims to explain what happens when we change those concentrations, say by adding a whole bunch of reactant A and increasing the concentration of A in the cell. Suddenly, the dynamic equilibrium of the reaction is stressed and the system will respond by trying to remove the extra A that has been added. And they can do that, it can do that by producing more C and D. So essentially shifting the equation towards the right until equilibrium is reestablished. If on the other hand, all the A being produced is removed from the cell and the concentration of A is decreased, now in order to re restore equilibrium, the equation will have to shift to the left in order to produce more A and establish equilibrium once again. 
So according to Le Chatelier's principle, in any reversible reaction that has established an equilibrium, any change in concentration will shift the reaction in the, dire in the direction that will establish a new equilibrium. Let's take a look at an example of Le Chatelier's principle at work in the body. In the metabolic processes unit, we will explore a biochemical process called glycolysis, which occurs at the start of cellular respiration. Most of the reaction in this series move in a single direction from reactant to product because the enzymes responsible for catalyzing each step of the reaction can only form products from the reactants. That is until we get to the fifth reaction, which is catalyzed by the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase. And this enzyme is actually able to catalyze a reaction that turns dihydroxyacetone phosphate, or DHAP, into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, or G3P. But it can also catalyze a reaction that turns G3P into DHAP. But during glycolysis, we don't want any DHAP. In order for glycolysis to proceed, we need G3P as a reactant for the next reaction in this series. So let's take a look at these reactions, starting from glucose. So we start with glucose, which is changed into glucose 6-phosphate, which is changed into fructose 6-phosphate, which is changed into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And then fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is split into two molecules, DHAP and G3P. So as long as the cell has glucose, both DHAP and G3P will keep getting produced. But any G3P is quickly turned into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So the enzyme triose phosphate isomerase will move only in the direction that converts DHAP into G3P, trying to restore equilibrium into the reaction by trying to put more G3P into the system because the G3P keeps getting removed. So this is just one small example of how chemical reactions and dynamic equilibrium work in living systems. Now let's take a look at how this concept applies to maintaining the pH balance of our blood. So the proteins in our blood have a problem. They have to be within a very specific pH range that is slightly basic between 7.35 and 7.45. If the blood in which they're traveling drops below or rises above that pH range, the proteins are in trouble. Their shape will start to change, a process called denaturing, which we'll explore later on in this course, and they are not able to do their jobs anymore. And when that happens, the condition, which is called either acidosis or alkalosis, depending on which way the pH shifts, um, can be very dangerous. The person can become sick, and if the pH drops or raises above um, 7.8 or drops below 7, the patient can even die from either the blood becoming too acidic or too basic. Thankfully, we do have a system in our blood that prevents significant changes in our blood pH, since obviously significant changes can be extremely dangerous to our health. And this system involves something called a buffer. So what is a buffer? Let's first take a look at uh, what a buffer does, and then we will get into how a buffer works. And here's something neat. If you add a few drops of a strong acid, like say hydrochloric acid, to a liter of pure water, the pH drops from a neutral pH of 7 to a very acidic pH of 2. But if the same amount of acid is added to a liter of blood, the pH decrease is only from 7.4 to 7.3. And that is because blood contains a buffer a chemical system that resists changes in pH. Let's recall what pH is. Um, the pH scale is a logarithmic scale that measures the amount of hydrogen ion concentration or proton concentration in a solution. The greater the hydrogen ion concentration, the lower the pH, and the more acidic the solution is. But each pH difference accounts not just for a single change in the hydrogen ion concentration, but a 10 times change in the hydrogen ion concentration. So, for example, a solution with a pH of 6 is 
actually 10 times more acidic than a solution with a pH of 7. And a solution with a pH of 5 is 100 times more acidic than a solution with a pH of 7, like pure water. So what do buffers do? Buffers essentially act like sponges. They absorb hydrogen ions when there's too much of them, uh, when a solution becomes more acidic, and they release them when there's too little or when the solution becomes more basic. Remember that acids are substances that increase the hydrogen ion concentration within solution. Um, in solution, they will dissociate into hydrogen ions or protons and their conjugate base. Now, strong acids, like this hydrochloric acid here, will dissociate or ionize fully in water so that all possible hydrogen ions or protons are released into the solution. Weak acids, on the other hand, do not dissociate fully and only some of the hydrogen ions are released into the solution. So back to buffers. A buffer is essentially a solution of a weak acid and its conjugate base, or the opposite, a weak base and its conjugate acid. In a good buffer solution, we want the amounts of the weak acid and the conjugate base to be equal. And so well, then what happens if we add a strong acid to a buffer solution? Well, the acid will add hydrogen ions to the solution, which will then combine with a conjugate base and increase the concentration of the weak acid. So the pH does change a little bit because we now have a little bit more of the weak acid than we did originally. But since the weak acid does not dissociate as fully as the strong acid that was added to the buffer solution, the pH does not change that much. Certainly not as much as the pH would have changed had the strong acid been added to a solution that did not contain the buffer. And this is Le Chatelier's principle at work here, too. We have a reversible reaction that has shifted to the left due to a stressor, in this case, a change in concentration on one side of the equation. Now, the opposite will happen if we add a strong base, which will decrease the hydrogen ions in solution and shift the equation towards the right. So there are quite a few buffers in the human body that help control the pH of both the intracellular fluid, that is the fluid inside our cells, and the extracellular fluid, that is um, our urine, for example, or our blood. The most important extracellular buffer system is the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system that happens in our blood. And this is the one that we will explore in more detail. So our blood contains a carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. It consists of a weak acid called carbonic acid and its conjugate base, um, which is bicarbonate ion. And both together create this buffer solution that is found within our blood. What does that mean? Well, it means that if an acid is added into our blood, essentially adding hydrogen ions or protons, the hydrogen ions will combine with the bicarbonate ion in order to form carbonic acid, essentially pushing the equation towards the right. What's interesting is what happens to the carbonic acid, which dissociates into water and carbon dioxide gas, which, as you may guess, can be exhaled out of the body. So this system is actually maintained and helped along by the constant addition and removal of carbonic acid. The carbonic acid comes from the carbon dioxide gas in our blood, which when combined with water, forms carbonic acid. And of course, uh, we can shift the equation towards the right or towards the left by increasing or decreasing how fast we remove the, carb the carbon dioxide from our blood um, by breathing it out. So how much we increase or decrease our breathing rate. So let's think of an activity that causes us an increase in breathing rate or hyperventilation. Let's say exercise. When we exercise, our body cells increase the rate of cellular respiration, which uses oxygen and produces extra carbon dioxide gas, pushing the equation towards the formation of more carbonic acid and increasing the concentration of hydrogen ion in our blood, thus decreasing the pH of our blood. By the way, Excessive exercise also increases the production of hydrogen ion in the body 
in other ways. So one of them, for example, is by the production of lactic acid in our muscles. We will explore more about this in the metabolic processes unit uh, when we talk about anaerobic respiration. But you may remember from grade 11 biology that in response to this decrease in blood pH, our brain sends a signal to our lungs to increase our breathing rate. This lowers the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood and then shifts the equation in the other direction. And thus, we reestablished our blood pH. So this carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system in our blood helps keep our blood mostly from becoming too acidic, but sometimes also from becoming too basic. The buffer system is maintained by the production of carbon dioxide gas by our muscles and by its removal via our lungs. And also on the other end, by the production of sodium bicarbonate by our pancreas and the removal of extra bicarbonate ions um, via our kidneys and our urine. So that's the end of today's video lesson. Um, don't forget to complete the quiz for this lesson, which will ask you to demonstrate your understanding of the concepts covered and apply that understanding to some real life examples. And one last thing, uh, in creating this video, I did kind of make the assumption that you were already familiar with pH, acids, bases, so I didn't cover them in too much detail. So if you need a little bit more of a review than I provided here, the online notes will provide a little bit more information and also I have, you know, extra video lists that can help with the lesson as well. So don't forget to complete your quiz and I will talk to you in the next lesson. Bye guys.